It's a real joy to be with you. Would you take your Bibles and go to Acts chapter 5? Acts chapter 5. I've been assigned the topic of proven ministry, why convictional ministry is a long-term demonstration. I suppose we could say if it's not long-term, it never was really convictional. The faith that fizzles at the finish was faulty at the first, right? A little quote from Dr. Adrian Rogers, who's in heaven now. Acts chapter 5, we'll begin in verse 1. But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property, and he kept back some of the price for himself with his wife's full knowledge, and bringing a portion of it, he laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back some of the price of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. And as he heard these words, Ananias fell down and breathed his last, and great fear came over all who heard of it. The young men got up, and after covering him up and carrying him out, they buried him. There elapsed an interval of about three hours, and his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter responded to her, tell me whether you sold the land for such and such a price. And she said, well, yes, that was the price. Then Peter said to her, why is it that you have agreed together to put the spirit of the Lord to the test? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out as well. Sometimes, you know, you read a passage like this, I'm going to continue, but it's just so awesome in ways, it's almost humorous in ways. Like, the young men of the church had a very important ministry in the early church. They carried out those God killed during the Sunday morning worship service. And, you know, those who believe that the signs and wonders gifts are still in effect today, like in the early church, have you ever heard any of them pray for the spiritual gift of discerning who God's going to execute and pronouncing execution on people on Sunday morning? You you don't hear that, do you? It's amazing how we pick and choose the supernatural things we're going to hold on to. So Ananias and Sapphira have been killed. The young men go out and bury them. And then verse 11 And great fear came over the whole church and over all who heard of these things. And at the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were taking place among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's portico. But none of the rest dared to associate with them. However, note this, the people held them in high esteem. And all the more believers in the Lord, multitudes of men and women were constantly adding to their number. Just to introduce the concept of the truth we're talking about, long-term proven demonstration of a convictional ministry, I would say that the reason why a convictional ministry must be long-term is because our God does not get the glory he deserves if we don't carry it out all the way through. He deserves all the glory we can possibly give him. And once you shrink back into man-centered cleverness, instead of functioning as a pastor on biblical conviction, you begin diminishing God's role and exalting your role. Man starts getting the credit and God starts being discredited. Somehow in the providence of God, the, the passion for the glory of God in his church grabbed me as a young minister and it's never let me go. And I would charge you to get hold of that. Because after all, it's all about his glory. Everything is about his glory. I believe, Brother Jim, one of the things that's really missing in our local church pulpits is a rich biblical theology. What's the main purpose of God? And you have to start with the glory of God. Then I would say the exaltation of the Son of God. Then I would say the centrality of of the local church. I believe you, if you get that, you get biblical theology in the broad term. Now, when I think about convictions about a pastor in the local church, I would give you nine of these. You might have 17. You might reduce some of them and combine them and get six. But just quickly listen to these nine convictions that have held me and perhaps should hold all of us. 
Number one, Bible saturated. We must be thoroughly biblical. Not only holding to the absolute inerrancy of Scripture, but the full sufficiency of Scripture. Wanting to passionately prove to this world that God's Word works. And He'll build great churches, even using infallible weak vessels like us, if we'll be thoroughly committed to the authority and the sufficiency of Scripture. Secondly, I would list Spirit-empowered Oh, many of us who hold to Reformed theology need to have a more openness to the power of the Holy Spirit. After all, brothers, if the Spirit of God does not bless our doctrine and our preaching and our ministry, we are sunk. Spirit empowered. Thirdly, a glory of God focus. I mean an intentionality that the totality of what we are, what we believe, what we do and how we do what we do must be thoroughly, completely for the glory of God. Christ honoring that in all things he must have the preeminence in our ministries. And this one might seem kind of redundant, like why do you have to say it? I have to say it because a lot of churches are not this way. Local church centered. I'm convinced the local church is the centerpiece of God's purposes for time and eternity. Everything, everything that has ever happened, everything that is happening, and everything that's going to happen in time and space history is to the end of the good of his church, the exaltation of the Son, and the glorification of the Father. The next one, preaching the word based. Preaching the word based. I could alter the order here on some of these. Maybe they all kind of stand equally other than maybe Bible saturated being first. The preaching of the word is the hub of the will of everything we are and everything we do because all of our ministries are informed by faithfully preaching the word in the power of the spirit. I don't know how to do the children's program if I don't have the word. I don't know how to deal with young people and families and parents and on and on we could go with all the ministries we may the subdivisions of ministries we may have. We've got to have the faithful preaching of the word to inform the totality of the church. And obviously, it is God's primary means of winning the lost and building his church. The next conviction I would list is every member ministry. There are no spectators in the church. Everyone has spiritual gifts. God gave them the spiritual gifts, not for themselves, but for the good of the body. Then world missions impassioned. We must have local churches that don't have a world missions program, but exist for the ends of world missions. And for us, world missions means encouraging, training, mentoring pastors, planting and revitalizing local churches. That's all Paul did, and that's all we need to do. Very local church centered in the totality of our missions commitment. And then the last one is what I call home life discipleship. Hope you catch what I'm about to say. We are convinced there needs to be church-integrated families in our congregation. We take the Word of God, we pour it into moms and dads, especially the dads, and as they take the doctrine and the truth from their pastor and their church, then they take it home, and they talk about it when they rise up in the morning, when they walk along the way, and they sit by the side, and when they lay down at night. Home life. But it comes from the church down through the families. So those are nine convictions that sort of have been a foundation of my life. And, uh, and I, welcome, I welcome sharpening on things like these because anytime we structure or organize something, have you noticed this? It always has weaknesses. I mean, I have got all kinds of things the way we try to illustrate what we're about. But I always say, man, there's, there's problems here. And I've had people encourage me through the years, would you put some of this in writing? And one of the things that bothers me about putting it in writing, is I'm always changing it. So, I don't know how you guys write this stuff. First of all, I'm not a good writer like some of these brothers, but how do you, how do you just decide, okay, I'm going to write this because about, that, about the time I think I'm going to write something, I want to change it to make it better. All right, let's get to our text here and unpack what's here. At least pack, unpack some of it. There's so much here we can't unpack all of it, but I want to give you six fruits of a long-term convictional pastorate. Six fruits of a long-term convictional pastorate. Or the subtitle could be, don't quit. <laughs> don't quit. Keep on being, I can't tell you the times in my pilgrimage 
in the buckle of the Bible Belt in a small, non-metropolitan, non-growing region in northwest West Alabama when it was so difficult and so hard. If God had given me a place to go, I would have gone. So we've talked about courage. I'm going to tell you what courage is when God didn't give you where to go. You just have to stay there and keep doing it. You grab yourself by the nap of the neck and you go stand in the pulpit where half the congregation hates you and you just preach again. And everybody said, well, you're so strong. No, I'm not strong. I just like to eat. And I don't have anywhere else to go. Our convictions had gotten about out enough in Southern Baptist life that they didn't like me anymore. So I didn't have anywhere to go. <laughs> oh, God's so good, isn't he? Aren't you glad he takes weak, pitiful vessels and does good stuff with them? It's just glorious, isn't it? I mean, I was converted at age 19, had no church background. My, my family was quasi-agnostics. I didn't know the Old Testament from the New Testament. I thought Nicodemus was Nicodemus. <laughs> I mean, really, you couldn't have been more ignorant. And still to this day, people will quote the books of the Bible and thought, oh, man, I didn't learn that in vacation Bible school. I, I need to go back and learn all that stuff. Briefly talking about the book of Acts... We call it the Acts of the Apostles. It could be the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Look how central the Holy Spirit is. Luke 24, 49, you're to stay in the city until you're clothed with power from on high. You apostles don't do anything to the Spirit of God enables you. And really in one real sense, the Holy Spirit is pastoring the early church here through the agency of the apostles, but he's doing it. It's a great transition book, the book of Acts. You have Jesus' ministry now to the apostles' ministry, the old covenant now to the new covenant, from Israel being the centerpiece of God's purposes and glory to now the church, the local churches being the centerpiece of God's purposes and God's glory, to God the Son being the immediate presence of God, to now God the Spirit, the, the, another helper, being the person of the Godhead who is fellowshipping with the people. Yet in one very real sense, biblical theology again, it's a continuity of God's desire to have for himself a people. God has this passion to have a people who will know him, love him, treasure him, be with him forever, and glorify him. And I love to say this. You know, God is so passionate for his own glory. God is the only being in the universe that can look in a mirror and say, wow. It is completely just and righteous. And God, far from just wanting to save individuals, which is glorious and wonderful, he wants those individuals to come together and be a people. The Old Testament Israel, something of a prototype. I don't think God's through with them, by the way. Something of a prototype, the New Testament, the local churches. So now we move over to the local churches. And God's saying, I'm building for myself a people for my own glory. Acts puts this in full bloom. As Acts unfolds, the spiritual-minded minded folks read it and say, oh, that's how God's going to do this. That's the methods, if you will. Acts shows us the foundation to this continuity is the means of preaching the word of God in the power of the Holy Spirit. Preaching the word in the power of the... If you get everything else right in your convictional ministry and you lose that, you lose everything. That's the foundation stone. And we see it all through the book of Acts. For example, there are 14 major sermons recorded in Acts and several minor sermons, if you will. Uh, there are about chapter 5, Peter has preached three different sermons, Pentecost at the temple and that before the Sanhedrin. And building off the mainstay of preaching the word and the power of the Holy Spirit, we see the people gathering together in smaller groups, house to house, where they care for each other, look after one another. The apostles come by and share the gospel. We see personalized strategic world missions. Later, as they're scattered, they go everywhere preaching the word, starting more local New Testament churches. And I, I don't see it commanded, but it's at least implied and understood that this slots over to home life discipleship. And early in my ministry, as far as functionality and organization of my church, I thought, biblically speaking, what must we do well before we do other things? I mean, are there some things that we can say, our ecclesiology, if you want to call it that, but I just call it our methods, our methodology. Are there some things we must do well before we do other things? And I came down to number one, preaching the word and the power of the spirit. That's got to be there. Secondly, every member ministry, have a way to help your people care for one another, look out for one another, minister to one another, evangelize together. 
And then personalized strategic world missions, where we don't just throw money at a distant organization and call it missions, but where we take ownership of missions in our local church. And then home life discipleship, it ought to be real at home, encouraging that channel of the truths of God in the church going into the home life. And I just told our folks, we're going to do this well. We're going to do those things well until you show me from the scriptures, prescriptively or descriptively, a different formula. I sometimes teasingly tell people I'm a Calvinist, Baptist, Methodist. I, I like the structure of the old Methodist, particularly I like the Calvinist Methodist. I don't know why the Arminian wing got all the structure, but nevertheless, I like those concepts. I was in a supposed meeting of leaders of a very large denomination a few years ago, and they were talking about where we were going as a denomination. You know, there's always been splinters and flips and disagreements in the big tent that's Southern Baptist. And they asked me, what do you think? I said, there's going to have to be something of a parameter not just on doctrine, but on the function. What does a local church look like when you organize it and put it together? Because quite honestly, we're having church planners who are going to plant Lord of the Rings churches, internet churches. And they were getting a lot of affirmation and encouragement. But I guess if you don't know what the real gospel is, that works. <clears throat> So those three things, preaching the word, personal and strategic world missions, small groups or every member ministry through small groups, were kind of the core of our convictions that we've, we've been riding that horse or those horses, if you will, for a long, long time. And I would say to you that Acts chapter 5 is something of a prototype that will occur in every single church that is built upon a convictional ministry. Now, not in the specifics of maybe the signs and wonders and praise the Lord in the grace and goodness of God. He's not killing every hypocrite that's in the service on Sunday morning. But the principles laid out, I believe, are consistent. And it's been uncanny through the decades how many pastors, particularly young pastors, have contacted us and said, Brother Jeff, we're, we're trying to do church discipline and we're trying to have a sound view of, of the gospel and conversion and it's causing Factions in the church and troubles in the church, and as they share with me what they're going through, it's almost like every single church is following the same pattern. It's just amazing how it's just the same. And the prototype of these principles, I'm convinced, is laid out in Acts chapter 5. So let me give you these six fruits <clears throat> of a long-term convictional pastorate. And we'll have to hurry, okay? Number one, the purification of the church. God is very concerned about his churches being pure. Now, let's be careful here. We're not talking about a local church removing the sinners out of its church, because then we'd all be removed. We're talking about the difference between an Ananias and Sapphira spirit and a gospeled, humbled, repenters spirit. It's a big difference. Ananias and Sapphira premeditatedly, willfully, knowingly wanted to use the church for their own good and their own glory. And they knew if they came in and laid that gift at the apostles' feet, pretending they gave everything like others were doing, then they'd get great praise and great glory. The problem with Ananias and Sapphira was they had higher esteem for the apostles' feet than they did the Lord's eyes. And so right here, Brother Richard, I don't know a pastor. If they were seeing souls saved, like Acts 5 and earlier chapters were seeing, if there's a discipline issue in the church, they would have set that aside and said, man, God's saving people right now. We've got to deal with this. God shuts the whole revival down and gives us almost a whole chapter of the Bible about the importance of the purity of the church. And if you will... Be faithful in a convictional ministry. God will use you to be in a continual cycle of purifying the church. I don't know how to say this, but perhaps there's not a, a church in Baptist life that has seen more church discipline than my church has. Maybe we're just that much more sinful. I don't know. <laughs> but we've done a lot of it. We've been sued in federal court 
for practicing church discipline. I don't know of anything that you can have happen in a church that we hadn't faced, but here's what we say. If a brother or sister is in sin, they absolutely must be approached privately and not talked about. And we're going to do everything we can to confidentially shepherd them back in place. They have to be brazen, hardened, opened, and refusing any help before we would dare bring them to an excommunication from the church. Can I get an amen there? Amen. That's the spirit we ought to have. But the principle comes out clearly here, does it not? God's just beginning the church age. And he shows us the importance of purification. I think, of course, um, please forgive me. I got something of a sinus thing, and it's in my throat, and my voice is a little weak. But this was needful because this was the beginning age of the church, and there, should, there would be such corruption and weakness in the church if God didn't clean this up. And because it's a prototype, an example of all churches for all ages. So one of the fruits of a convictional ministry is the purification of the church. So much more I'd like to say, but let me give you this quote by, <clears throat> I guess, the most prominent early Baptist theologian, J.L. Dagg, who said, when discipline leaves the church, Christ goes with it. If I could give you this encouragement, brothers, you can't blunder more than Jeff Noblet has blundered. You can't fail more than I failed. I've done it wrong so many times. I've had to get in my own pulpit many times and repent. Thank God, not of adultery or embezzlement, but, but of saying I was not thinking right here. Really, this is the wisest path over here. Here's my point. If you're trying to see God glorified in his church, he'll use a very faulting, weak vessel Amen. and build a great church for his glory. Does that not encourage you? Boy, it encourages me. I mean, like I said, you couldn't be more ignorant than I was when I started. I've still got a lot to learn. We're still repenting and growing, but a convictional ministry will lead to the fruit of a purifying church. Everything God uses, he purifies. And if I might just say this, God wasn't just purifying the church, he was purifying the pastor as we went through difficult seasons of public church discipline cases when nobody in our area had ever seen one before. Nobody. And man, we got significantly attacked by the Baptist brethren for doing such a thing as striving to practice church discipline. Because in my town, at that time of about eight or 9,000 people, we had removed people for unrepented of sin. And then I'd go to Walmart. We only have one. <laughs> and I'd see several people who hated me. And they, they loved hating me. <laughs> I'd take my family to a restaurant and there'd be a couple of tables of people who were first cousins with the family we just disciplined. I, I have often looked to these dear brothers from the Master Seminary and Dr. John MacArthur to encourage me, and they have. And I asked some of the staff one day, I said, man, when y'all discipline somebody, how do you do this? Do you not just see them like we do when you go out in Walmart and restaurants? There's 12 million people here. We never see them again. <laughs> then you're a, you're a cheater. <laughs> you need to come to my town and do some of it. <laughs> no, but seriously, that, that conversation actually happened, but it, it is difficult when you're in a little county seat town, brothers. But boy, I'll tell you what, it causes the pastor to get on his face. It causes him to go before the Lord and say, Lord, if this is of you, fine. But here we go. I've got so much more to say, but I can't say it because I need two hours, and we don't have two hours. <laughs> Number two, the second fruit of a long-term conviction ministry, the unification of the church. Not the unification church, obviously. The unification of God's church. He's building a unity here. If you will, look at verse 12. At the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were taking place among all the people, and they were all with one accord. When God disciplined Ananias and Sapphira through the mediation, if you will, of Peter, Peter, as one of the pastors, carried it out, if you will, by speaking it, the church then kind of got over secondary things and began to put one another more important than themselves. That's in the Bible, amen? 
and begin to walk more in the Spirit, which wrought a Holy Spirit unity in the church, which our churches so need today. Far too often, you young pastors, you'll go out here and you'll take a Baptist church somewhere. And like I tell our guys as we're trying to help them along, I'll say, look, you've got a congregation. And now you're going to have to preach the word and the power of the Spirit until you find a church in there somewhere. Same thing here. The unity comes from people who are spirit wrought, spirit changed, spirit filled. We do not seek unity. We seek truth, which brings unity. And so these guys are walking in truth here. God stepping in and helping them with the purification element. And then comes the purity. They were all in one accord. There's nothing like it, folks. I'm just telling you, I've been in my church 43 years. And the last 15 to 20 years, there has been the sweetest love and unity on earth. And you know what? I sense it in this church. Don't you love Richard Caldwell? And I, I sense in these people a real work of the Spirit. I, I sense that gospel humbled repentance that is essential for spirit wrought unity. Now, what's happened in too many of our Baptist and evangelical churches is we've mistaken flesh toleration for spirit unity. Let, let, let's get along with that guy. He's powerful. He's, now, let's get along with that lady. You know, she talks a lot. She'll be a lot of trouble. So let's, let's appease them. That's flesh toleration. That's not spirit wrought unity. Now, understand, I've been at this 40-something years. You, you, you can't expect to go out there and, okay, in three years, we're going to get this thing fixed. It ain't going to happen. All of our guys we disciple and mentor in church planning and revitalize their church, I say it over and over and over. You better have a 20-year vision. You better have a 20-year vision. You don't know how long it takes of actually preaching the word and the power of the Spirit to get a majority of your folks walking with God. Preach. But it takes a while. <laughs> I just celebrated my 40th anniversary a few years ago, and, and one of the brothers we'd been mentoring and working with, dear brother from Illinois, they had him to do a video and just commend me on the ministry or whatever, and he came on the video and he said, well, let's see, you're starting your 41st year, so you're on your third 20-year vision. <laughs> and I guess that's true. I thought, what is this going to look like? I have no idea. But don't judge your pastorate in year five or year seven. You've done a lot of things right. It just takes a while. To say the purification lead to unification. <clears throat> so much more I did say, but I don't have time to say it. Number three, you might put this one in front of unification, but they're certainly first cousins, if not two sides of the same coin. Number three, the sanctification of the church. The sanctification of the church, this, this idea of God's pulled their hearts off of the things of the world and in a fresh way, their hearts are focused on the things of God. I guess so if God killed two people in your Sunday morning worship service. And the pastor said, let's come back tonight for worship. Everybody's going to be here. But in like principle, God does it today. Time after time after time after time. And boy, the first few church discipline cases we had trying to purify the church we didn't know what was going to happen. I mean, just, you just don't know what. But you know what I noticed? There was a sweet, humble, pure focus on the things of God afterwards. And then after two, three, four, five weeks, there was the blessing of God and new additions to the church. We'll get on that in just a moment. But notice the, the verse here. Don't just say I'm popping this out of the air. This is all in our text. Look at verse 13. But none of the rest dared to associate with them. I agree with the scholars that say there are probably a lot of people, aunts, uncles, friends, relatives, whoever, who are meeting with the church. I mean, this is a great thing that's going on. People speaking in tongues and uh, flames of fire coming down on these guys. I mean, people were drawn to that. But when God said, yes, this isn't just an extravagant entertainment program. This is a church of a holy God. So I'm going to deal with things like Ananias and Sapphira. So those folks who just came for the food, in the amusement, None of the rest dared to associate with him, decided, you know what? This is real stuff right here. I just don't think I want to be in this group right now. <laughs> I've, heard, I've heard people talk about how to get your people walking with God and not walking in the world. Faithfully practice church discipline and the world won't walk with your people. 
They'll say, we don't want to be around people like that. This is too serious for us. So that's an element of sanctification. They're set apart from the things of the world because their very church is a sanctifying element in their lives. As none of the rest, the text says, dared to associate with them. So there was the falling away of some who previously met with them and maybe appeared to be part of them. And by the way, if you lead, if you lead a long-term convictional ministry, you must accept seasons of folks who will fall away. We have lost about 600 people, active attenders or members, in my pastorate. Now, 600 people is a lot in a town of eight or 10,000. Three different splits, and I've often said if any of the two splits had gotten together, they would have had enough votes to vote me out. But somehow, and God's proud, I had a guy call me one day, Brother Richard, and he said, we were talking about reforming church. He said, how did you keep the property? I'd never thought about it. How did you keep the property? And I said, what do you mean? He said, guys that reform the church to biblical health, they, they get run off and can't keep the property. And that's when I thought, well, if any of the two split groups had got together, I, I would have been run off from the property. These things are part of God's purposes. Brothers and sisters, while, while I've said very clearly, we're all sinners and we all struggle, but willful, open, brazen compromise and being on the church roll must not happen. It projects to the community that our God is unholy. And no wonder he's not blessing. I was going to say this in my introduction, but I didn't have time. <laughs> um, I love my church. I love, I love being there. I love the people. I love going back to them. But it hasn't always been that way. Quite honestly, in the first 15 to 20 years, when the purification wave first started, and you still do it all the time. Don't misunderstand me, but the intense purification season was in, in session it was the most painful, depressing place to go to. I didn't want to go. What was it John Piper said one time? He said when he first took over Bethlehem Baptist Church up there in Minneapolis, he said there were 300 people sit on the front and hated me. He said, I want to tell you something. I'm going to out love you. I'm going to out pray you. I'm going to out give you. And I'm going to out live you. <laughs> and you, you're going to have to do some of that. You're going to, have to live past that stuff. The sanctification church, their hearts and minds set aside for the things of God. And there's a really a paradox in, in having a convictional ministry and God working in your church. Because on the one hand, it's the most glorious, blessed place on earth. And on the other hand, it can be the most depressing and difficult place to attend on earth. As you face people, I don't know what group you fellowship with, but in the Anchor and Truth Fellowship of Churches, this is common we talk to guys all week long, practically every week, about their struggles. They're, they're weeping, they're depressed, they're discouraged. And we just say, keep on going. There's a ram at the top. You'll just keep on going. Hey, it's a long-term confessional ministry. It, it wasn't short-term until it didn't work. It's long-term because it's right. And we cast ourselves in absolute desperate dependence on the God of the Bible and the God of heaven and say, if you don't help me, if you don't bless this thing, we're done. And God, in effect, says, that's where I've been trying to get you, right there. Now, watch me do things that no one can explain. If, 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 people, if men can explain the success of your ministry, it's not of God. They should look at your church. I have people tell me that all the time when they come to our conference and meet our people. They say, I love the preaching at your conference. Music's overwhelming and wonderful and biblical. But then I met your people. I knew God's hand was on this place. This next one might surprise you. The sixth fruit of a long-term convictional ministry, convictional ministry, the admiration for the church. It just blew me away when I first meditated on this. Verse 13, but none of the rest dared to associate with them. That's sanctification. We've already talked about the unification. We've already talked about purification. However, last part of verse 13, the people held them in high esteem. Did you see that? However, the people held them in high esteem. It means they lauded them. They praised them. They didn't want to be with them officially. We're, we're not joining up with you guys, but um, we think you're the real deal. We respect you. 
Now, I know what, I know what pastors are going to think. They're going to say, well, <laughs> I, I've been trying to honor God and do it right. And like Jeff Noblet said, I've failed and blundered, but we're trying to do it right. And, and these people that hate us and leave us and try to undermine my leadership and are working against us, they're, they don't hold us in high esteem. It hadn't been long enough yet. Did you hear me? It, haven't been, it hasn't been long enough yet. It takes a long time. I, I hate to, I, I do this some because I want guys to know it's not unusual. And so when it happens to you, you won't freak out so bad. But, but the vicious things that were stirred in our community, there were absolute lies against us, were just overwhelming. I had a deranged lady show up in my backyard one night. She, 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 she was deranged. I mean, she was, bless her heart, she was in terrible shape. She had a baby that had earthworms on it. She'd been living in the woods behind my house. And I, Brother Jim, I understand what you're saying about waking up and being scared. I tell you, I fixed a little bit of that scared. I got a nine millimeter pistol in my, by my bed. And my wife wakes me up in the middle of the night and says, there's a woman in the backyard with a baby. And my immediate thought was drugs. They're trying to get me out in the yard and kill me and kill my family. So I run out there, man of God, with my pistol locked and loaded. <laughs> I know where I am. I'm in Texas. I'm okay. Don't worry about it. God is my witness. I go out there with that nine millimeter, and this, this exactly happened. I walk out there, and that lady looked at me and saw that gun. She said, and I love the Lord. That's the, that's the first thing she said. I'm not making that up. 100%, this ain't preacher talk, 100% truth. Well, we call, she thought she'd been bitten by a rattlesnake. She was just delusional. We call the sheriff. She winds up at the hospital. The next morning, my heart is burdened, so I go down to the hospital. thought, maybe I can just minister to her. I walk in the hospital. I just see her off in the distance. She's being treated. I wasn't even able to talk to her. But after that event, this is just one of many now, okay? After that event, one of the nurses in the hospital spread throughout our community that I beat my wife up. And they saw her in the emergency room because I went down there to check on her. I got a brother-in-law who's a lawyer. He said, do you want to own that hospital? <laughs> if you just, just prosecute based on But that was stuff all the time. Just crazy stuff. And you lift it and it lingers for years and years and years. Blessed are you when they, Jesus said, not if, when they say all sorts of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. But I asked Pam about this and I said, and we've had a lot of this happen. Now, this, now you're talking about getting 30 years into the process. 25, maybe 25 to 30 years into the process of striving, failing, weak, messing up, yes, but striving to have a convictional ministry. Then all of a sudden, event after event after event. I, I sat across from a man's desk, a businessman in town, and he had visited our church some, and I asked him, how did you get to Grace Life Church? He said, my wife attends so-and-so Pentecostal church across the river. But I told her I wasn't going to a Pentecostal church. I'll go to a Baptist or Methodist church. And so she told her Pentecostal pastor, he will not go to a Pentecostal church. He said he'd go to a Baptist or Methodist church. I've never met this pastor. I don't even know who he is. But he told that wife, take your husband to Grace Life Church of the Shoals and he'll find God. The admiration of the world. However the people held them in high esteem, the text says. We just had a centennial celebration of our little town there, Muscle Shoals, Alabama. Hit recording capital of the world, if you didn't know it. That's our esteem. And um, the mayor and his wife left our church in one of our splits, quite loudly disapproving of my doctoring and my ministry. But they asked me to do the speech about Muscle Shoals at our 100th anniversary celebration. And the mayor was the mayor who left my church as one of my enemies. He hugged my neck. I hugged his neck. And that's been consistent for many years now. I can run into men who led revolts to undermine my ministry, and I can hug their neck, and they hug mine. And there's a sweet love and a sweet... Now, they shouldn't join our church, and they wouldn't. Matter of fact, they don't qualify, so we wouldn't let them. But they do respect us because we've stayed with the stuff a convictional ministry 
that, look, folks, I'm not strong. I'm just more scared of God than I am of them. I'm serious. One last thought. I'll be 64 this Friday if I live that long. I thought, why do I get myself any of these things? I committed to Richard a long time ago because I think he's one of the finest men, finest pastors I know. And I, 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 I don't say that about many men. But I committed to Richard, and, 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 and I'm preaching twice up in Montgomery, Texas in the morning. Then I fly home, and I, preach for, I teach for three hours in our pastoral training institute. Then we have the funeral service of one of the most prominent young men in our community who was tragically killed, what, three days ago in a car wreck. And then on Friday, I have my gallbladder taken out. <laughs> so I don't know. I may not live through Friday. I don't know, but... <laughs> What would it be like to be 64 as a pastor? Put your head on the pillow and realize I built this thing a lot on compromise. I built this thing a lot fearing men. I've done a lot of what I've done just to kind of get along and quote, make it work. And now I'm too old and too tired to fix it. And I promise you, brothers, you can mess up a lot. You can blunder a lot. You can fail a lot. But if in your heart, I want to see God glorified in his church. I want the world to look at the church and say, God must be doing that because no man can do what's going on down there. If you'll live your life that way with a strong convictional ministry, your happiest days will be your last days. I'm going to, are you listening to me? I've got it made. You wouldn't believe how well my people take care of me. It's phenomenal. It's just like they can't do enough to bless me because they've seen the ministry proven before them. I, we've probably had the best year we've ever had in the last year. And overwhelmingly, our growth is coming from young married couples. And we're doing nothing you're supposed to do to reach young married couples. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> but Jesus said something interesting. My sheep hear my voice. You thunder the truth purpose to apply and live out the truth and those sheep see it and hear it. They don't even understand it, but they are drawn to it. Spurgeon said one time that if a, a pastor will put his nose to the grindstone in those early years, maybe about halfway through, it won't be so much of a grind in the latter years. It'll be easier. I'm on easy street. It's gotten a lot easier. So there's a balancing truth to what you brothers told us. And it was so good for me to sit there fresh, guys, and say, if it takes my life, it takes my life. Amen? Amen. I mean, if, if it takes, you couldn't have started with more nothing than I had when I started in the ministry. So I might be just back to nothing in a worldly sense. But at the same time, kind of like the book of Proverbs, these principles in Acts are general principles that I think more than likely, but probably God will bring forth in your ministry where you'll end better, far better than you started with God blessing your work, with the admiration of the world around you because they know you're real. Now, the last verse, verse 14, I'll only mention it. The, the, this is number five, the multiplication of the, the, the church. What does it say constantly? How, how's it worded there in verse 14? Um, and all the more believers in the Lord, multitudes of men and women were constantly added to their number. Here's what I want to say. We all want verse 14, don't we? People getting saved and saved and saved and baptisms and churches growing. I love that. I'm all for that. But you got to get verses 1 through 13 too before you get verse 14. If you don't get 1 through 13, what happens is you'll mimic verse 14 through manipulation, schemes, and gimmicks, and easy believism to make it look right when it's not right. Are you listening to me? But here the Lord was added, because the Lord got the church pure. If you're going to have some verse, you've got to have a clean hospital. Now here's the last one. The purification of the church the unification of the church, the sanctification of the church, the admiration of the world, at least to some extent, almost always there. Daniel had it. Joseph had it. We go and talk about that a long time. The multiplication of the church all to this one primary end that is the total reason you'll take your next breath and the total reason anything ever exists, the glorification of God. 
It's all for God's glory. Ephesians 3.21 is kind of a theme verse for my life and ministry for our church and our ministries. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. And those are on a horizontal plane beside each other. One's not over the other one. You can't exalt the head of the church without having a passion for the church. I wonder why some guys in the ministry are just full of the glories of Jesus but have a small concern for the body of Christ. If he died for it, we ought to live for it. So he's getting glory for himself through his church. If his church is right with him, say it this way, if we do church his way, by his methods, fueled by his power, it will bring him all the glory. That's why I get up in the morning. That's the only thing that get, kept me going through the difficult years. The glory of God is worth it. I just sort of made a covenant with God early that let's prove your word works. Let's prove your word works. And the Bible is fully inerrant and absolutely sufficient. Y'all have been wonderful. Please pray for me that I don't somehow blunder and dishonor my Lord in my last days. And thank you for being such a wonderful and joyous person concerning the truths of God. God bless you.